This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you everybody for joining us today. With me is John Cameron and our special guest, my boss here at the show, Mr. Gail Morgan. Gentlemen, we didn't cover to it last week, so I'm going to get to it this week. There was a Time article in uh, about the secret campaign to save the elections. Now, that's actually a nice little euphemism here. And it's actually very well written because I got to almost the end of it before I kind of realized that, hey, wait a minute. If somebody else had run around and secretly strengthened the elections, changing the way we vote and campaign laws all behind the scenes and secretive, people would have had a cow. Mm. But now all of a sudden they're patting themselves on the back for making sure that they got a result they wanted. It's a bit disturbing how open they are about it. It's, it, it's I don't know, it seems strange to me. I, I have a theory, you know, like I, I have about things I haven't even heard of yet. I'm actually hoping that the, the writer wrote it in the way he wrote it to expose the to 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 make it because the the people on the left are so absolutely sure, and I, I'm not going to call them liberals because we all know the classic definition of liberal and they ain't it. Uh, we call them national socialists, except for they finally figured out that's what Nazi Germany was and stopped calling themselves that. Um, but if if you look again, I agree. If if people on the right um, would have published something like this. Um, the, the, there would be the world would be up in arms. There would be rioting. There would be demands for the election to be overturned, for recounts, for for people involved to go to prison, um, for for some of them to be, to be shot for treason. I mean, the the uproar would be calamitous. And um, you know the, the 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 insidious nature of the. the those people are so certain that their viewpoint is is correct and that anything that will help them achieve their goals is uh, morally not bankrupt, that it makes me sick to my stomach. Uh, and it reminds me um, in, in no small way of, you know, what we used to say when we looked at "Quote unquote elections in communist China and the Soviet Union before it fell, and in puppet regimes in in South America, and in military in in Africa, and all the rest of that, where a group of people got together and preordained, in essence, um, the outcome of the election, made it uh, impossible for the the opposition to get the word out, suppressed any opposing viewpoints, and made it." easier for there to be election fraud. And they're, they're, they're stating that they made it easier for people to vote, but because of all the things they put in place um, to get people uh, out to vote without any barriers to their voting, the logical consequence of that is that uh, a, a lot of those votes could very well be not qualified. So I'm, I could go on and on and on literally for the whole show about this. But I was, I was disgusted by seeing it. And, and what disgusted me most, and this is why I'm hoping it's almost tongue-in-cheek by, by, the, by the reporter, although I don't think it is because that side is so certain that they're in the right that, um, that, that they'll do anything. I'm, I'm, I was literally nauseous as I was reading it. What do you guys think? Well, I think it's it's the mindset is actually what's dangerous. If these things needed to happen to strengthen the election, then why can't you be open about it? So, you know, I'm going to take a little bit different stance on it because who does the yelling, John? Hmm. It's the same people that are saying, well, we, you know, we did this. There's nobody left to yell because the Republicans have not um, been confrontational at all. Uh, the closest they came was was Trump for four years, and I'm not sure how much a, a Republican Trump is or was, uh, because well, he was a Democrat all the way up until he got elected uh, yeah, yeah. before he ran, I should say. Yeah. And 
and their whole philosophy is, hey, if you don't like it, yell and scream. And if it's a, if you like the results, um, don't say anything. It's all quiet, covered up. Don't say anything. And it's the same people making the noise. If it doesn't, if they don't like it, but if they, as they say, the the end justifies the means. If if they got what they wanted, it's okay if they break the rules. And as far as preordained elections, um, I ran. For the assembly, I believe it was in 2006, maybe, somewhere around there. Um, I discovered at that point the Democrat Party not only runs the local elections here, but they, before the election takes place, they already know who's going to win. And when the city council gets the people in their seats, they quickly decide which of those city council members is going to move up to the assembly, which one's going to go to the Senate. This is determined when they, after their first elector, possibly before they're even elected to city council, they know who, who they already know who's going to be the next assemblyman from the Sacramento area. This is all preordained. Hmm. And having run uh, for the assembly at that time and there was uh, six, six Democrats, um, one Republican, and one Libertarian in that race. And so uh, in the primary, it was uh, the Democrat contest, and oh yeah, we'll let these two guys speak. And pretty soon I picked up on that kind of the, the mode of things, and so I started addressing the big picture of everybody and singling out uh, one of the Democrats to to pick on him and attack one of his positions. And it went from being, we favor gay marriages to while we favor gay marriages, we would never force a church to perform them. Hmm. And I, I tackled one item for each debate and, and I made Dave Jones change his presentation at every one of those because I would pick on something and he would adapt it for the, for the next debate. Hmm. Anyway, come November, uh, David Jones was not taking any interviews or debates or anything. Therefore the news media would not interview and talk to myself or the Republican. So you're the reason we can't talk to assembly people around here. Can't get any discussions with <laughs> debates with assembly people around here. But it's the political the machine. Primary. Yeah, the political machine does exist, mm -hmm. and it's that political machinery that is what we actually have to fight. And one of the things I realize in the campaign is how much grift is essentially exists, and this whole shadow campaign is essentially a bunch of people who are grifting off the system, protecting their grift. Well, and, and I think the, the I, I'm starting to see a phrase bandied about that I really like, and it's the political class. And quite frankly, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think you can drive like maybe a, a razor blade in between Republicans and Democrats, except on two issues that they raise the rabble about. Uh, you know, if, if people are convinced that, that, uh, that these two parties represent uh, a difference in government, then uh, they throw their their uh, means and their energy behind these two parties. But when when these parties are elected, uh, the reality is that the future looks exactly the same, no matter who's elected, Republican or Democrat. But they've convinced the voters that they have to make a choice of either Republican or Democrat. I mean, I call them lots of names, but they are exactly the same party because they are the political class. You know what the difference is, John? What? You know what the serious difference between them is? There's one thing that stands out between them. The Democrats hate Republicans, while the Republicans despise Democrats. Hmm. And that is the major difference that I find between the parties. Yeah. Well, no, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's. Um, you know, it's it's like people. It's like racism. I mean, there's no there's there's no logical difference between the, the between the parties because the political machine survives 
uh, the people that are helping out, I don't know whether you want to call it graft or you want to call it corruption or whatever you want to call it, the people who make their living from uh, government, make their living from government no matter what government is in power. Um, and, and it's the status quo. And as long as the voting public is convinced that uh, there is a difference between the two, and I don't know why they are based upon the outcomes, they will pick one of those two to get behind and nothing will ever change, which is why libertarians are now doing something. They're, they're taking a page from uh, political history, which is they're running for school boards and they're running for local assembly and they're running for all the rest of that. And I think I might take a shot at the school board here on, on the plank of, of just being an outrageous um, voice against the power of teachers unions, which means that the teachers unions will throw all of its weight uh, behind me. I don't even have a kid in school, but I, I live in an area of Sacramento that where people have to sit, can't send their kids to, uh, um, well, unless they have means, they have to send their kids to uh, Sacramento, um, the Sacramento school district, which is horrible. I mean, it is just, it's, it's, it might be down there with Chicago and LA. So, um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're learning as libertarians that what you have to do is grind away at the local level and get some power, amass some power, and then get into the assembly and get into the state Senate and then, and on and on and on. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that the, the media, um, foments this war between the the Republicans and Democrats as if there's a real difference between them when there isn't. Because then people think that by voting for a Republican, they're voting against this guy in office that they despise everything about. Or if you're a Democrat, you're voting against this guy who's in office. But the one fact that about this major national election that blows my mind, and and you can tell how biased the... the um, the, the lamestream media is, or blamestream media. Uh, this guy Trump, who I believe is not a Republican uh, by any stripe or means, um, he got more of the popular vote. He got more people, more people voted for him than voted for Barack Obama. And this is in the middle of a pandemic with uh, all of the media that puts out the messages being against the man without uh, with anything negative about his uh, opponents being suppressed and repeated lies about him. The New York Times is still posting Russian interference in the previous election. Russian interference in the previous election. There was no Russian interference in the previous election. And, and it was all a, a false flag operation that, that originated probably with Hillary Clinton. So... If it hadn't been, this is the thing that, that, that they won't say, if it hadn't been for COVID, uh, Donald Trump would have been elected by 20 points and Republicans would have swept the House and the Senate because it is quite frankly always about the economy. And if it hadn't been for COVID, um, none of the efforts of the National Socialist Movement would have made any difference. But do you see that that statement made, which is absolutely true? Nobody's observed politics who, who is speaking the truth would disagree with that. Is anybody saying that? No. They're acting as if um, a choice was made by people to vote against uh, Mr. Trump and vote for this other guy because he represented a difference. And all he represented was the opposing party in an economic downturn. Okay, I'm off my rant. We can rant about something else. Yeah. Oh, Clinton identified it as it's the economy, stupid. Yeah. And and quite literally, uh, Nancy Pelosi and her team ruined the economy in order to get their guy elected. Yeah. And and I believe that 100 mm. percent uh, when uh, she said few years into his his uh, term as president, we are for anything that he is against and against anything he is for. Hmm. That pretty much summed up the following three and a half years when she said that. Hmm. Well, I think we all have to remember that Hillary Clinton and the DNC 
and their pals in the media prop Trump up in the Republican primaries because they thought he'd be easier to run against. So well, if, they'd have just, yeah. if they'd have just left Trump alone, we wouldn't have had him. Hmm. So, you know, there's that whole mess. But we're going to move on. The new allegations of, of our Mr. Governor Cuomo over in New York City, who won an Emmy for his performances in his... Uh, <laughs> In his, in in his press, press conferences. Yeah. In his was press that handed to him by his brother who used to... I, I don't know, questions? but he yeah. won an Emmy for lying, which apparently yeah. those were performances. So I guess the Emmy was actually warranted. Yeah, it's all acting. Apparently it was. It was all made up. Yeah, the numbers that have come out are just crazy. Um, the, the the amount of people who, who died and they... 10,000 people died and they weren't reported in order to keep him looking good mm. until after the, the new year. And then, oh, yeah, we had to fix those numbers. Mm. And, and over 10,000 people died there while New York was doing its best uh, practices ever that everybody should be following. And just ask Fauci. Mm. Yeah, just ask him. Now, it, so they reported ten or 12,000. And it turns out there might be another 5,000. And they they purposefully prevented those numbers from being, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, revealed. They they stonewalled uh, and, and refused to answer questions about them because they were worried that the Justice Department would sue them, uh, which didn't happen. And I don't know why it didn't happen. And at the same time, all this is going on. Cuomo is being interviewed. Where's his brother on MSNBC or one of those? Is, is yeah, interviewing CNN, I think him it is, yeah. and sending and handing him softball, uh, feeding him these nice little sweet pitches to hit. Um, and and uh, it's it's an abomination. And you know, fortunately, Cuomo is so arrogant that he gets in a fight with every single mayor of New York. And mayors of New York actually have, in, in, in the real world, actually a little more political power than the governor of New York. I don't like de, de Blasio. He's a racist. Um, you know, he's, he's putting in quotas in, in these elite schools in New York so that fewer Asian kids can go to them. And then, um, you know, basically putting racial quotas in. So I don't like him. But, but I do like the fact that he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with uh, Cuomo. And the wonderful thing is that, that because of the lying um, and the stonewalling and all the rest of that, Cuomo could very well be stripped of his emergency powers. And I'm just wondering when, um, you know, that uh, uh, Governor Newsom here in California will be stripped of his emergency powers. Hopefully the recall will happen and he'll be stripped of all powers. Because, I mean, if you look around the country um, – the, 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 the states that have done the best, and there's no difference in the number of deaths from, from the pandemic, um, where their economies have survived and thrived, um, have been ones where lockdowns didn't happen or happened, uh, uh, there were fewer lockdowns. There is no correlation causation between lockdowns and, and, and health successes. But there is certainly, um, and I think we're going to talk about unintended consequences a little later. I hope so. There is certainly um, some some unintended consequences to the pandemic, where they looked at at uh, only one issue, which was this virus, which turns out eight times as many people actually have it as have been tested positive. So it's about sixty percent of the population of the U.S apparently been exposed to it, according to the CDC, their numbers. They didn't say 60%, but if you read in between the lines. But the unintended consequence, especially under um, uh, for, for uh, people of color, black, Hispanic, Asian, small businesses. Anyway, we can talk about that later. But it's, it's just been, it's, it's been horrible. And these dictatorial, um, typically Democratic governors, uh, for the most part, I think they're all Democratic governors who decided that they uh, knew best and ignored science, not their made up science, but real science, um, have, have crushed their economies and, you know, caused literally probably 10 million businesses to close forever. And, um, you know, the, 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 I, I want to talk about the th their thinking, and I know they'll never say this. They don't care about small business owners because small business owners never vote Democrat. 
Um, they, you know, once they're big enough, they need to grease the wheels, they vote Democrat. Once they need to bribe elected officials, but small business people are libertarian, you know, right leaning. And so they're never going to get their votes, never going to get their money, all the rest of that. They don't care whether their, their, their business goes under, where all those people are unemployed, whether they lose their life savings, they do not care. So, um, Anyway, yeah, well, on to the next. I'm sorry, I'm ranting. No, we'll, we'll actually combine. Well, we'll combine a couple of our last two topics here. Um, according to, oh, I let me. I got now. I've got to go find it. Half of all small black businesses have been wiped out due to. They says COVID, but of course we know it's government action over COVID. And the New York Times has finally discovered that there's unintended consequences, as we, we were talking about. That you know. These actions of closing things down have actions far beyond trying to save the lives of people from COVID. You have people who are now dying from drug overdoses and suicides rates have doubled. Spousal abuse, neglect, malnutrition, um, violence, depression, you know, um, as, on and on and on and on. And I want to say, I want to say this again, because I say it every time we bring up the subject, I want to make sure it gets heard. Um, according to the World Health Organization, the World Bank, probably um, any, any, and I hate those national organizations, but they have stated over and over and over and over again that lockdowns are not the solution. They do more harm than good, especially to children, especially to the poorest of the poor. 100 plus million people on this planet have been pushed because of the lockdowns, not because of COVID but because of government ineptness dealing with COVID into the poorest form of poverty. That's living on a dollar 98 a day or less. People who are in that group die like flies. So shame on all of these supposedly caring governments around the world that have used lockdowns to try to deal with a disease and shoved 100 million people into a form of poverty that they can't even comprehend. So I'm going to bring that picture down a little tighter and just talk Sacramento because I deal with some of the poor population I represent. Um, uh, the people live in public housing. Um, I'm, I, uh, sit on the Sacramento House and Redevelopment Commission. And specifically, um, I'm responsible for representing the residents in the county as opposed to in the city. But my, my view of what's happened in the last year is these people feel isolated. I've seen more deaths in the past year. And yet, I don't know of a single person who has died of COVID. So those numbers are, are going up, but not realistically from COVID, maybe from the circumstances around it. And then I look in the community and, and the major stores at Arden Mall have closed. Um, uh, Nordstrom is gone. So the people that were making a halfway decent rate wage in retail have lost their jobs. Sears is, is closing, they will be gone in two months. Um, so they don't pay as well as, as uh, Nordstrom maybe, but those people are gone. You go uh, through downtown and midtown, there's a ton of stores that are all closed and gone. So um, it's definitely taking a toll. And I don't think that um, it's necessarily uh, focused on any stratus other than the economic stratus. If you're financially well enough uh, and connected, you're going to do okay. If you're, if you're not financially set, it's going to be terrible on you. And it, it's not, I'm not going to say there's any relation to skin color necessarily on that. Well, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's, it's intentional racism, but uh, it is, it is racism nonetheless. The, um, when, when our candidate for vice president spoke, uh, libertarian candidate for for vice president Spike Owen, Spike Cohen, Spike Cohen, right? Cohen, yeah. Um, uh, one one of the things he talked about was uh, Joe's conversations with people and his conversations with people as they went to door to door, basically in the ghetto, 
And those conversations when he brought up police and police brutality and, you know, defund the police and all the rest of that, conversations they had were different than, than what the, the lamestream media wants you to have. Those people know they need police to protect them because there's crime. The left, they, is what? Promoting, the left is promoting this wipe out the police yeah. um, and promoting the racism. It's not the liberals, it's the mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. and, but what, yeah, what they're, what they, the conversation, and I hope I didn't talk over you, Gail, the conversation he had points out why these black businesses are getting killed. The biggest barrier to people raising themselves up uh, from poverty didn't exist 50 or 60 years ago. And basically it's licensing and regulation. Our parents, if they wanted to start a garage, would, would work on cars in their garage until they had enough money to put some money down on a garage. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, need, they didn't need a certificate. They didn't need insurance. They didn't need to worry about uh, all, the, all the environmental stuff and all the rest of that. Those barriers, if you're a you know, white middle class person who can borrow some money from your grandmother or you know, throw $20,000 on a credit card, those things aren't barriers. But if you have no credit, no background, no education, all you're doing is willing to work hard and the, and the local cop will come shut you down because you're violating regulations, those are barriers. And that's why that black small businesses fail because they didn't have the capital, they didn't have the access to banking, all the rest of that. What there are is cash businesses that operate on the very fringe and anything that, not fringe of legality, that's not what I'm saying. Um, is that lunch? Is lunch ready? Anyway, so... Um, so they're the ones most impacted by any downturn in the economy. Black first, then Hispanic, then Asian, then white. And so all these people are bootstrapping themselves, can't bootstrap themselves because they fight uh, this wall of regulation and licensing that did not exist 50 years ago. But what it does is entrench existing businesses and prevent competition by others. Yeah, well, those with... Um, support systems with support structures, be it family, friends, uh, business contacts, access to loans, to lines of credit. Those people can survive. People who work on cash business, whose businesses per, uh, have to go month to month, cannot. And that's the difference between people who are poor and trying to pick themselves up and those who are, like you said, already established or have a large support system to draw on. And those with the large support systems have been doing well and surviving and those with not have been going by the wayside. And that is our time for today, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. We here at Libertarian Counterpoint want to thank you for joining us. You can find us at libertariancounterpoint.com. You can find us on all our social media outlets and on the podcast networks. Just look up Libertarian Counterpoint. And from all of us here, please remember to love everybody. We also invite you to watch Libertarian Counterpoint podcasts each Monday. 5.30 p.m. on Channel 17. This show also available on YouTube, Facebook, and other social media platforms and podcasts. Thank you for listening.